Welcome to Barbell Shrugged. I'm Mike Bletzer here with Doug Larson, Andy Galpin, and uh, we've traveled up here to uh, Ruka headquarters where uh, we're doing, where, where they train a lot of MMA and a lot of other things as well. And uh, we're here with Daryl Christian. He is, uh, he is one of the guys that trains a lot of MMA fighters. He's uh, a wrestling coach. He's got uh, a crazy career in wrestling overall, multiple-time national champ, been all over the world competing, and now you consult, coach, yeah. MMA fighters, a lot of guys in the UFC, people like Dominic Cruz. Yeah. Very impressive. Yeah, it's been fun. Uh, staying busy with everything. I think the sport's evolving so fast that the education and the little structure is, is behind, and that's why you're seeing a lot of different uh, things happen within the culture. Uh, so Mike just gave you a, a brief intro to kind of who you are, but can you go more in depth and tell us who you are? Yeah, you know what? I started my wrestling career at University of Oregon, and then after that, I, uh, I transferred that to the Olympic Training Center in Colorado for seven years. So I've been a part of national teams and structure for, for a long time, from you know, strength and conditioning with Jimmy Radcliffe at uh, University of Oregon. He's a huge mm -hmm. speed and explosive guy. If you yeah. don't know that name, Jimmy Radcliffe is, uh, I mean, high power plyometrics. Like, that's the guy. There's mm -hmm. a reason why Oregon's been the fastest guys in the country for 30 years, and it's almost entirely because of Jimmy Radcliffe. Just a legend in the field. Yeah, anytime you hear about jumping and explosive power, like I always hear about Jimmy Radcliffe. Right, yeah, godfather especially, like that. Especially growing up. My strength coach loves the guy. That's Actually, I didn't really put that together because typically – wrestlers don't spend a lot of time doing sprinting jumping plyometric stuff so that was probably a huge advantage for you guys to have him yeah it was it was it was a huge advantage because he brought in a lot of that structure and uh you know we we saw so many gains from it and oh then yeah. we we increased the endurance portion of it um he we used to do a lot of uh, circuits out of uh, Autzen stadium and then coming in and doing hour-long circuits and then he would allow us to do other things but you know, he, this is back, you know, 95 through 99, so he had just started implementing his system. This is, you know, I'd walk into the McCoskey Center there and have Phil Knight, you know, he'd be walking around. I didn't know who he was, and all of a sudden he was this guy with red hair, these crazy Nikes, and mm -hmm. I go, hey, Coach Rad, what, who, who is that? Is the guy Booster here or something? He's like, that's Phil Knight. I'm like, what? <laughs> like, wow. He's the Booster. He yeah. is the Booster. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, so, but uh, so he, is he the founder of Nike? Or just uh, he's the, actually the guy Nike? that, uh, you know, the history is is that Bowerman was at University of Oregon. Yeah. He was trying to cut off time with his athletes, and, he, you know, he started his shoe designs there. Just he, he had no means of trying to make it a commercial equity uh, capital equipment, and mm -hmm. he literally put that in. And, uh, you know, Phil Knight walked onto the track team. He was a business major. He comes in. He's got a VW bus, and he's like, hey, Coach, I, I love these shoes. He's like, do you think you know I could sell them for you? So they, they created a contract, a 51-49 deal. Mm. He pulled him in the back of his BW van, and he like go to local track meets in Coos Bay. That's where Prefontaine's from. Mm -hmm. And this is the same time in the, you know, the early 70s when, when Prefontaine was starting to make his big rise out there. Mm -hmm. And then all of a sudden, you know, that's how Nike just exploded over time. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I... Phil Knight basically came in the right time. I mean, I, I wish I was the guy walking on the track team, just <laughs> <laughs> participating, uh -huh. and then launching Nike. You know, yeah. Bowerman's yeah. the guy that's famously said, "If you have a body, you're an athlete." Yeah, and mm -hmm. that's how they took Nike from oh, wow. a sports company to everyone on the planet wearing them. Mm -hmm. Right, Bowerman's super famous guy. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay, so you started so, yeah. University of Oregon. You're you're wrestling there. No. Yeah, I wrestled there and uh, wrestled with Chael Sonnen there um, through mm -hmm. college, and then. Uh, you know, it was either go the route of uh, into the workforce or go to the Olympic Training Center. You know, Randy Couture and Dan Henderson got me more involved with the Greco side of it. Um, you know, we were Olympic camp. I was, I was rooming with uh, with Dan uh, there, and uh, it was his last Olympics. And then uh, Randy was out there. That was, you know, that was the year that uh, Rulon Gardner, who won the gold oh, medal, yeah. I got to meet Rue and then been yeah. a f been teammate for him for years. You know, still one of my close friends. And uh, so I moved out to Olympic Training Center after that. And uh, from 2000, 2006, I was out there competing, going around the world. And basically, that's where I built the, the infrastructure of what I am as far as mentally, um, the scientific-based process. I had two Russian coaches, one from Azerbaijan um, that had trained in their, you know, masters of sport type deal. Mm -hmm. And then my other coach there was Momir Petrovic, who was Olympic champ out of Yugoslavia. Mm -hmm. I mean, we're talking in the seventies where the guy would train out of a 10 by 10 room, there'd be world champs in a 10 by 10 room. They'd have nothing except for a small little deal. And, you know, I learned a lot of the structure from them about 
the science of not necessarily they didn't have the data, but more of just volume and, and, and anaerobic versus low intensity versus high intensity and development over time. Because if you're training 365 days a year and you're trying to get the best and you're trying to peak three or four times a year, and then we're doing it for a four-year process. So you're looking at you know the overall volume and saying how, how do we maximize every day without overtraining. Yeah. And that's something that I kind of... I owe them everything for that. And then uh, once I left the Olympic movement, um, I won a couple of national titles in 04, 05. And then 06, they changed the rules on me, and I was going into 08. I had won everything, and I was really excited about the career. And then they changed the rules up, and I was like, man, I, I you know, I, a good year, I make $25,000. And I was, you know, being there. And once they changed the rules on me in seven days before the world championships, and I, I had uh, some results I didn't appreciate at the world team trials, after I was in the finals there, and uh, I basically just walked away. And then I went into s- working 70 hours a week in medical device sales. Um, and, you know, overnight, you know, there's some good money there. Um, and then I, my still addiction that I have for athletics, I got into uh, 70.3 half Ironman races. I didn't do any sprints. I went straight into it. Uh, I never really swam competitively. <laughs> Jeez. Yeah, I, I, the, my friends at Olympic Training Center, Andy Potts and uh, Brian Fleischman, Hunter Kemper, these guys yeah. are the studs uh, out there. And uh, they're like, you just want to do this? And I said, yeah, man, I just I want to push myself a little bit just for having fun. I love that grind. And, yeah. uh, mm-hmm. you know, I, my first year I did uh, May, June, July, half Ironman a month. And then I did the World Championships in October. Um, you know, I was running like a 126 wow. pace after 56 miles on the bike. So I broke 430. Uh, it's sub four three. I was like, you know, forty second in the world that year, and then I took some time off, and then uh, got in. Not until recently, in the last two years ago, I got in coaching again. So that's how I came to this point. Oh. Oh, that's incredible. Uh, I want to rewind a little back, a little bit. The um, talking about the volume and the intensity of training and having to, having to keep up with. I, I think in strength sports where we've spent a lot of time, we're always talking about. In, intensity and volume and having to measure that mm-hmm. and just hit it right on the mark and it and it actually is pretty easy and uh yeah. shrink sports because you don't have all these other variables so now we're training yeah. we're training wrestlers or mma fighters and they have all the practice that's going on they have yeah. wrestling they have boxing they have uh jujitsu mm-hmm. and then now we have strength training as well and then one of the things i've noticed is a lot of times especially with guys uh, are, that are not at the top yeah. the coaches aren't talking to each other so how do you how do you even periodize how do you do you keep up with that you know i think that's the uh that's a million dollar question that uh, <laughs> a lot of these big gyms are have a lot of money and some of them don't have a lot of money and you see this sport has moved so fast that the old school ways of even weightlifting um you know obviously there's different systems the russian system the bulgarian mm-hmm. system and what we have adopted but as things move so fast uh, without the education, you start seeing injury rates just going through the roof. And then now that Yasada has been a part of this thing, you see people changing their regiments. Yeah. And, uh, you know, it's a big deal. I was part of Yasada for seven and a half years. And, uh, I mean, guys were getting popped for 15 grams of na- 15 nanograms of marijuana and two year ban. And yeah. you have guys as oh, and the thing is, is you saw how, how else are you gonna supposed to recover? Well, yes, <laughs> exactly, for sure. And so you get this guy. I mean, I had a teammate of mine, Joe Warren. He was a world champ. He would have won the Olympics. He got tested positive for 15 nanograms, and the average, just the legal limit, is 150 right yeah. now. Oh. Yeah. And we're talking a Olympic gold medal that you your whole life are versus these. Yeah. They'll take a tainted supplement. And then all of a sudden, it's like nine months. Oh, I didn't know. Yeah. yeah. And the well, thing is, it's crazy because that whole supplement industry is a, is undocumented too. But yeah. But anyways, like the variables you talked about is, is huge. I, I think that my experiences with the big gyms, the coaches are, are amazing. That Their hearts are in it. They want the guys to do the best. But a lot of times, like, I mean, if you're making you, – if you come together at the table every night, everyone's kind of aware of what, what we need to do is, like, if we have a business – Everyone's got a business plan. Say, hey, this is your role. This is our role. We're cool with it. What's the mission statement? And in the MMA community, whatever athlete you're working with, that's the mission statement. That that's like, for instance, Jeremy Stevens. I work with. He's KO Productions. That's his. That's his full like uh, S corp, right? So yeah. that's his whole thing. What's the what's the mission to, uh, to get him the str- as powerful as he can be in cardio shape and get him fre- get him ready. But a lot of times, if most of these coaches don't talk a lot, and a lot of times it's either from their busy schedules or choices it is. So all of a sudden, you're getting mixed results all the time. Yeah, is there a single coach managing that usually, or is it 
Or is there no no head coach that's managing other coaches? No. So the thing is, is we're all independent contractors, and they're all independent plumbers. There's no union together that we all follow the same footprint. Mm. So you'll have a head coach because he runs the gym. He owns the gym. He's getting his percentage. And a lot of these guys, not all, every time that, you know, just like anywhere else, you guys all get your haircuts. You all go to all different people. So you don't necessarily adopt the same person. So sometimes you have a different wrestling coach, mm. a different striking coach, but you might go to the same gym, but you don't have that. Um, and you, you, everything's about trust in this sport. And a lot of it is just like sometimes it's by you, know, you have acquaintances, like yeah, I'll work with that guy, but most of the time it's like, hey, it doesn't really vibe with me. It's like a chemistry in a relationship. I mean, <laughs> you guys are probably, yeah. besides your guys are obviously married or what have you, a lot of times chemistry doesn't work for some people. So. What I've found is that the head coach might be a head coach, but a lot of times they won't talk to the other coach until the night of the fight. I mean, this is just like that show, wow. you know, a lot of the reality TV shows, it's, it's a married at first sight. I mean, basically we're together in a ring and we're trying to get, we're on the corner trying to get the guy to do the best he can. We, it's the first time we've seen each other maybe once out of eight weeks. Yeah. So the conversation of periodization doesn't sound like it's something that really comes up that much. No, not at all. And a lot of it is because I know how to train the guys. A lot of times I just try to, hey, look, you know, I make myself accountable and I write out a program and I'll say, here's your weights and this is what it's going to be in this week. This is how you're going to bit. Here's your taper weeks. Here's your uh, peaking weeks. Here's recovery. Here's your strength weeks and all these base, you know, you're building these things. You guys know it from the strength industry, like what you guys have built yourself, but also that's one variable that you guys can control. Mm -hmm. But when you're having to get multiple people together and say, hey, this week we're going to keep it light. Like, no, dude, I, I bang them out. Mm -hmm. And a lot of right. times you get these guys overtraining, cortisol levels to the roof. They, they didn't lose the weight this time, or the hormone levels are off the charts. Yeah. yeah. Are you using HRV and things like that to help help teach the, the fighter, the athlete, to, to monitor their own stress levels? Well, this is the thing. Uh, it's, it's, it's cost. Um, these guys are fighting sometimes for 20 and 20. Yeah. So we're tw talking twenty thousand dollars, and if they win, they get an extra twenty. Yeah. Yeah. But if they lose, they're twenty. Then they got to pay all the coaches. So and you get usually ten, ten percent, fifteen percent at the gym. Sometimes yeah. it's outside coaches they're paying, taxes, travel, and all of a sudden they're like, "Hey, do I want to?" I mean, most of the time you have to. Uh, there's only particular athletes that are really into. You know, a lot of it goes down to uh, some expertise and to trust because they're like, "Oh, does that really work? Does it help me?" And a lot of the other coaches like, "Hey, I only need six weeks with you. We'll bang it out." The problem is, is by that time they get there, they're either, they overtrain them and then their cortisol levels through the roof and they're just, they're basically, their body's just zapped and they're producing more estrogen. They stop the testosterone and all of a sudden their body, you see these guys in these crappy weight cuts as well as performances. And, but the thing is, is the HRV and all that kind of stuff. I mean, for $150 a month, you can pay an independent source, like, you know, place like the training lab, yeah. uh, phase four is another scientific based training place. The extra hundred and some dollars is, you know, it's just like having like insurance. Some people are like, I don't need insurance, you know, for my car, I'll just take care of it. It happens. But as you know, it can be catastrophic. And same thing with health insurance, you know. But it's very important the guys that do do the HIV because now we're getting a fingerprint to every athlete. And these are individual sports, so they need a fingerprint because everyone's RMR, the resting metabolic rate, it's different. Um, their their VO2 is different. And what they're burning for substrates or fats or carbs is different. So all of a sudden, you can't train everybody in a team practice the same. So that's something that I think is the next evolution when they say, hey, I'm going to put off $600 for this. Because sometimes just the individual test alone are a couple hundred bucks. But to start it, but that gives you a good platform where you're at and a good baseline. And that's some of the reason why with some of the guys um, I've gone to and have come to me to work with them because I keep a metrics at the beginning and what's real. Because as you guys know, there's so many people can tell you you're doing great, you're doing great, but you're never getting the results. And so what we do is I, I try to look at punch count in a fight. So I, I took their last seven fights, last five fights. Hey, what's your punch count? And I look up the metrics on these metrics.com. able to see all that he throws. Like, for instance, Jeremy Stevens, I started doing his cardio program. And it's mainly low base. Here's a guy that is a hard, hard, and he's anaerobic through the roof. I mean, he is going crazy. But he would always lose to point fighters. So they'll point them out because they're afraid, and they'll win by just points. And not they won't ever hurt them. But what I did is I said, look, when I started with you a year and a half ago, you're doing 60 to 70 punches. He's like, all right. These last two fights, you fought Henner Burrell, who was one of the best ever for a long time. He won like 27 fights in a row. 
And then all of a sudden, he loses Dillashaw. He's too big for the weight class. Goes up. Jeremy smashes him, and he hits like 156 strikes in that fight. Right. And that's doubling your punch output. And this is like yeah. seven years into your career. So how do you do that? Is it because he just had a better boxing coach, but his cardio is through the roof? Then he fights Frankie Edgar. Come again. Frankie Edgar averages 190 punches every three rounds. He only averaged 60 punches in this fight. It was from the ground. Mm. Jeremy Adder is 158. So all of a sudden, cardio comes in there, and that's something the next piece we'll talk about a little bit. But, yeah, like I said, the periodization and, and everything, HRV, heart rate technology, um, you know, I think recovery is huge because now you're able to see where you're at on a mega wave. Anywhere you're at on, on recovery is huge because now I, I basically think of it as like, you know, pulling up the stoplight. Is it red, green, or yellow? You know, yeah. how do you work? And that's kind of the next stage. What are the, what are the top three things you're looking at? Like if you, could, <laughs> if you could pick three things, three measurements that you're looking at an athlete. So say there's an athlete and they're not looking at anything. Mm -hmm. What are the first three things you want them doing? You know, I think the first thing is first is get a scope of what their, day, what their average normal week is. You know, how many days a week you train and overall volume? Mm -hmm. And you say, oh, I do 16 hours a week. I do three, three times a day. All right, well, um, what's that intensity? And, I mean, if they don't know, and you just give them a 1 to a 10. And then kind of base it at that and then get them a couple of weeks. This is just kind of like doing a, a food diary log, you know, like, hey, what are you eating? And then kind of give a baseline, and then you can kind of give a little bit of a ballpark. But that's the first starting, the full, full on base, the overall volume. And then um, – and then from there, I think it's uh, – we'll do um, – I, I go from the overall volume of the week, and then I, I start to add, like, okay, what are, what's most important to you? Well, is it striking or this and what coach is involved? And then from there, like, what are your expectations of what you're doing? And then after that, if, most of the time, the expectation is, well, I want to win, but, you know, then, then right. it goes, how do we get there? Right. Yeah. Uh, I know you always use the hashtag cardio is king, so it seems like you're 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 very cardio heavy, and I, I don't imagine that means that you discount you doing normal strength training and, and mm -hmm. explosive power training. But um, tell us more about that. Like how how important do you think cardio is relative to other uh, performance measurement or performance training, like like lifting weights to get stronger? You know what? I think the all it's it's uh, it's all a piece of the pie in a sense to me. You know, it's the same mm -hmm. thing. All the ingredients on a pizza. I think everything's important. I think, but it's all different stages and different amounts. I think that at the beginning, you know, getting base and structure, um, joint stability and all that kind of work, um, and then all of a sudden you're looking into your power and your strength and the power plays and the explosive phase. I think all that stuff is important. But I think that the, the big thing that I've, you know, working with the training lab and working with phase four and then doing my own um, that I've done through my career because I've always been known for cardio, and that's the, just the thing I've always bred. Because after everything breaks down and everything's even, the cardio is what shines, and I think that that's something that people talk about power and these guys knockout power. But remember that you know, uh, MMA is more like triathlon than anyone really wants to uh, respect it. You know, the Diaz brothers for a long time. I remember racing with Nate and Nick. At times, I didn't really know them very well, but I saw them at races up at Vine Man up in uh, Northern California. And the thing is, is the cardio component is so big outside of it, um, the low base. We train the house. We, we build these houses. We, we build these athletes from the from the roof down, majority of the time in the MMA because you're going so hard all the time, mm -hmm. and you're, you're you're flatlining at the top for so long. By the time you get to the fight, their their baseline is is less than when they started yeah. where they're at. You know, yeah. mm -hmm. but um, the cardio for me. Um, is so big outside of the training. So you can do all your, like, periodization and stuff within, um, you know, different phases within the strength and stuff like that. But also it changes over time. So you're not doing strength the whole time. You're doing base, and then you do some strength, build power, build explosiveness, and then all of a sudden more agility, speed work. A lot of footwork is what I found um, for me anyways is getting more footwork, footwork for movement in a sense. These guys, their feet moves, almost like a wide receiver, defensive back for footwork, for, for striking, for wrestling, for kicks, all the different things. And then as we get closer, um, you're doing more just straight speed stuff. And then all of a sudden we have sprints and stuff like that. But everything fades out accordingly and the pieces of the puzzle come together. But the cardio component that I found mm -hmm. is outside of everything. And they're like, well, how do you do that? I only have so many hours. Mm -hmm. I mean, I've added another 20, 20 hours a month. Um, in uh, almost, almost almost 16 to 20 hours a month in most of my guys' programs in running. 
Is that when you say cardio, are you saying just long, slow distance? I'll do different distances. But then I'll do like more uh, threshold stuff at a particular time as we build into it. So they'll, you know, they do these 30 second sprints, minute sprints of these crazy inclines and people have nasty injuries and plantar fasciitis injuries and, you know, like glutes and the, all these different uh, issues and tight muscles from these inclines that are doing these crazy sprints like it's you know going into the Drago like old days that we see these you know the old Rocky movies mm -hmm. these going crazy on these treadmills but a lot of the times what I try to do is I'll build them with their thresholds so they'll do high the high pace for a long period of time and as we get closer we'll reduce it and then I go straight to sprints after that just to top them off because usually the last five weeks of the camp um, they're already prepped and then now mm. it's just you know topping them off with sprints, getting comfortable with it, and then reducing volume with the closer increasing intensity. And most of the time, the cortisol levels and, and, and they're peaking properly. We, I, I have worked with a lot of <laughs> high-level athletes, a lot of the MM fighters, a lot of the same fighters. Yeah, we've shared for a sure. Lot. Yep. Uh, one of the things you almost never find with these guys is a willingness to do the hard stuff. Mm -hmm. Like, they're going to find the high-intensity intervals. They're going to do the hard rounds. It's just we don't find them at this level people not wanting to do that stuff. Yeah, motivation's yeah. not a factor. No. And so I see a lot of crossover or carryover, too, with the CrossFit community. A lot of people like it because you get to go in there and you get to redline. Yeah. yeah. But the problem is if all you do is redline, right. that's when we end up breaking, whether we're CrossFit or MMA. Yeah. So this other piece or this other component of it is really important. And sometimes what I've found with the MMA guys, that's the harder thing to get them to do. Mm -hmm. Is and we got some exceptions like you know Pat will do that Dirk and he'll ride for his bike for hours he doesn't care but the other ones were like how do we yeah. so how do we convince the people to do it how do we motivate them and then how much how do we control it so that they don't end up running for seven hours a right. day yeah. or something like that so how do <laughs> yeah. we put brackets on it yeah a lot of times what I do is um I'll have them start easy so if they do they do mitts or they do wrestling or they do even sparring I'll have them do like another twenty minutes that you use the low base afterwards a lot of it's recovery mm -hmm. but what I'm trying to do is I just want them to think about it as just burning fat so a lot of times mm. the guys are like oh I'm in shape I'm I'm lean and I'm like okay well let's just let's keep building this road so you get more oxygen and aided blood you get more you're burning more fat for energy and just kind of exit because a lot of times you, you throw some information out to them and they're just like what'd you say yeah like mm -hmm. I don't know what I just tell me what to do and a lot of times like you know talking to some guys like you know, uh, they never really ran before, and uh, they're you know when they do sprints, they don't have to think about it, right? Because they're just like, oh, I gotta get through it, gotta get through it, gotta get through it. But when you're running a slow pace, it's boring as hell. Yeah, people don't want to do it. I mean, they're just like, I mean, uh, how do I do this? Like, but a lot of times it starts getting you in that mindset of grinding. And grinding, grinding, keeping going through. I mean, the CrossFit guys, I see a lot of people going through the stuff and like, how do they do that? They're doing the same shit over and over and over again for time. Like, how is that? Like, I'd get bored. Yeah. But all of a sudden, they're just getting into it and getting into it more. They're thinking. They're just driving, grinding. And they get used to that uncomfortable pace. They're getting used to that uncomfortable weight because they're focusing on each rep. And all of a sudden, same thing, each step. And they're looking at And all of a sudden... You just start to be able to daydream, then you and start enjoying these runs because you start getting in your head. You start thinking because when you, after a period of time, it's it's not easy to do. Like I mean, Jeremy Stevens and I, you know, here's a guy that you know couldn't last two rounds in the middle of his camp because he was so exhausted before when I first started working with him because he cuts from you know 170 when you when I first started working with him it was 177 to 145, and most of the time he'd be 163 like 165 a week of. Yeah. And so when I started working, we'd be three weeks out from a fight. We'd run for an hour and a half. Mm -hmm. Easy pace. And he's just, dude, this is easy. All of a sudden, you keep the threshold in your legs, and these guys now are recovering faster. You know, there's some, there was a good study out there. that uh, There was a study, but also an article that came out from uh, marathon runners, how they, their body will secrete a hormone in a sense over time because all of a sudden the pounding, and then they, they get almost numb to it. They get mm -hmm. numb to pain. And so the same thing, you look at these guys like Diaz brothers who – have done all low base training. They do all triathlon, running, swim. They don't lift. They don't do an explosive training. And the thing is, you look at their fights and their volume is consistent over time. But also the fact they've taken some major punches, they don't get hurt because their bodies just keep pr producing this hormone at some point. But yeah. Uh, yeah, the cardio base it has to be a separate key outside of everything. Yeah, be one thing I would say is if you're going to adopt something like this, be careful. Uh, if you haven't done any running besides intervals, don't jump in and run an hour and a half tomorrow. Correct. <laughs> you got to build to it. Yeah. So we barefoot have, run on concrete. Exactly. That's, yeah, exactly. That's the way to go. Yeah. <laughs> we we use this a lot. Uh, get, 
prior to Rio. We just started it last week getting ready for trials because um, some of them, the Olympic trials is in about three more weeks, right? Mm -hmm. We start with walking. All right, can you Damn. walk for an hour? And it yeah. sounds really easy, but if you haven't walked for an hour, you're going to get like 30 minutes in and you're going to be like, oh, I'm yeah. so bored. This yeah. is awful. Yeah. <laughs> or whatever you want to do. Rower, mitts, right. you can use your thing. But yeah. really make sure you progress to these things if you want to uh, start adding some of this stuff in. And don't mm. go from zero to 20 miles this week. Yeah. Like you got to build that stuff up uh, in, in an intelligent fashion or you're going to break. Your knees are going to get shot back. Something's going to happen bad. Yeah. Uh, and MMA certainly, and then also in, in CrossFit and other sports, as the yeah. competition is approaching, you know, people are pretty beat up. They got injuries, that their joints are achy or, or hurting. But at the same time, they might know that they have more weight to cut in the case of MMA, mm. or they just their their fitness is just not where it needs to be. So they need to do more volume. But at the same time, they don't want to show up, you know, excessively injured. Not yeah. th most people show, show up to a fight somewhat injured. It's just a reality of of the sport. Yeah. But um, but, of course, you're trying to minimize that. How do you keep people healthy as the competition approaches but still keep them training? So that's the thing. That, I mean, that is um, a lot of these – there's some great coaches out there that kind of know their athletes, right? So they're like, mm. hey, uh, you're kind of like look fatigue. Uh, a lot of people – well, a lot of guys that hold mitts are, hey, you're not hitting as hard as you usually do. I kind of know where you're at. Um, but that's also same thing is like sometimes it's hard because, you know, these athletes are super tough. They're in a combat sport. Yeah. I mean, how do you know you're, you're rocked? You just got hit hard in the face five times in a row, and you're like, "No, oh, I'm good, coach. <laughs> yeah. Keep me in." Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, he's even with Patrick this last yeah, week yeah. and Cummings. Like, you know, he was out there, got rocked first round bad. <laughs> Again. Like, he, I was like sitting in the back, and I was like, "Are you kidding me?" Like, the, and all of a sudden, I'm like, "Here we go!" Like, dude, you got to recover. And then he recovered. Then he, he's like, "No, I'm good." And I'm like, "Dude, he's still probably like still half concussed. You know, he's <laughs> got some like he's hurting." And yeah. then he got through it, you know, just mentally pushing through. But, you know, a lot of the times with the athletes, I try to a lot of, um, you know, doing a lot of, and it sounds crazy, but a lot of the rolfing stuff mm -hmm. that helps with joint mo mobility stuff is huge. I try to get these guys to do a lot of tissue work once a week at least. Mm -hmm. Even if it's just massage, just get tissue work. Um, you know, I got I bought a set of those nomadic boots for my guys. So mm. whenever I, I have them use them for compression a lot of the times for mm. recovery. Oh, like, um, a, like a Normatec? Yeah, a Normatec boot. Yeah. yeah. And then okay. um, I also do a lot of different, uh, like, active release stuff for them. They uh, they go do it themselves. But to, to just I think a lot of the stuff is just keeping maintenance. You know, a lot of these guys will pay, you know, they'd rather get broken versus like maintain and that's this other thing too it's just more of accountability i mean a lot of this sport is about accountability and a lot of times the missing weight is accountability you can't be i mean it's a professional sport if you show up i mean how many times you guys been at work and dealing with people even coming here and you're an hour late like it doesn't matter it's just like missing weight like you just have to be accountable you know yeah. and i think that's something that within this sport a lot of times coaches will push guys and they're just like they'll crush them in the first two days you know they're three weeks out from a fight and i've seen it where they'll they'll go hard because they're pushing them, right? They want to push them that edge, and that's great. But all of a sudden, the guy's gone for three days. Mm -hmm. That including just, you know, his body is just upside down. He's like, oh, take some time off. Then the guy's, like, missing other practices. Mm -hmm. Mentally, he's like, oh, I'm not strong enough, you know? Yeah, that's why yeah. it's so important to have a plan. Yeah. So you plan the workouts, but you got to plan the recovery stuff too. Right. Because that gets out of the loop if you don't. You don't just go hard, and then when I start feeling crappy, I'll just start backing off because the back off ends up being who the hell knows how long. So you need to plan both aspects of that. When are we going to go hard? When are we going to go light? When are we going to go medium? Or whatever your plan is, right? it's all got to be there. And that's got to be done before you start. Yeah. Right. Making it up on the fly. You need to adjust on the fly, mm -hmm. but something has to be laid out. So having a plan is better than no plan at all, but the plan will, will evolve as you go. Yeah, yeah for sure. Let's take a break real quick. I yep. want to get into recovery when we get back. Okay. Cool. Welcome back to Technique Quad. I'm Doug Larson. I'm here with former UFC heavyweight champion, Boss Rudin, and he's going to teach us how to win a bar fight. Woo! Love it. Uh, so in a bar fight, if someone comes up to you and they, they get right up in your face like this, what do you do? No, the thing, if you, you have to make sure, understand first, if this is going to be serious. If you say, okay, his friends are backing up in the back, this guy needs to be canceled out really fast, really violently, so his friends are going to be intimidated. Headbutt is the best weapon for that. I just need a little bit of boom, this. So if he stands close, the only thing I need to do is little, create a little distance by stepping back, bang, and right away hit to the face and then just keep going and <laughs> drop the guy down. Be crazy, I told my daughters. I said, crazy. just headbutt him in the face and be crazy. Be the crazy bitch because then you will never fight again. And that's what you do when you are in a bar fight. <laughs> Somebody comes up close to you. Not forehead to forehead though. You go forehead to the nose. Forehead to the nose, it's very right. important. If, he, if I, 
I'm standing here, normally I would always stand like this talking, you know, I listen, because this is my defense. If you would do something you would, with a headbutt coming, mm -hmm. I, 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 st I can't stop him. Mm -hmm. You know, so the trick is you, to hit my... You're standing like this on purpose? Yeah, yeah, okay. just like I'm talking to you, you know, like I'm, but I'm defending myself now. Mm -hmm. But I'm just, you know, what's going on? Once he comes close, you want to hit the nose. Mm -hmm. If he loads up for a headbutt for me, mm -hmm. load up and give me one, I do this. Okay. I lean forward and yeah. I let him hit his face into my head. Mm -hmm. Hallelujah. <laughs> Hallelujah. Okay, so what if someone comes up to you and they're, they're pointing you on the, on the chest? Okay, what you do then, you say, don't do that again. And what you, if you say that, of course they're going to do it again. And they do the same thing. It's a stupid thing. So he does it. I said, no, 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 don't do that again. As soon as they do it again, grab the finger, go all the way back. They shouldn't have pushed you against the chest. <laughs> Okay, so you're, maybe you're in an in a argument with somebody else and one of his buddies runs up behind oh. you and starts, starts grabbing you and starts choking you. Once you start choking, what you want to do, you want to make sure that he doesn't pull his shoulder back and put you against his back. So right away, what you want to do is step to the side, step behind him, and now, whoop, I can lift him and I can drop him or I can drop on him. And on the street, that's not going to be fun for him. <laughs> All right, three ways to keep yourself out of a bar fight. Thanks, boss. You're very welcome. You bet. Godspeed. Cool. Party on. Oh yeah, we're back. Oh yeah. Oh, there you oh, are. Yeah. <laughs> right, yeah. the, the audio <laughs> was. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> You're digging yourself a hole. <laughs> it's just getting worse. It's just getting worse. Let's just let's just get into it. <laughs> yeah. Daryl, can you tell us about the taper, the elusive taper that that uh, no one seems to understand? I hear a lot of conflicting information about. You know, a taper. You know, is a, a two-week process in the programs mm -hmm. that I run um, and being part of. I think uh, it's important to understand that, you know, it's it, the last two weeks, or the, especially with weight cutting, any other sports may be a little different, but the weight cutting cortisol levels are uh, a problem. And, uh, you know, I, I try to stretch it out um, about 72 hours um, of workouts. Uh, usually the, f mm. the second week out, um, it might be a little less. Um, and I try to get them to be done sparring um, either the Wednesday or the Friday of the week before. Um, so no sparring the week of. Yeah, the week of, no sparring at all. You're yeah. done uh, usually the week out, so that's about 10 days, um, and depending on how they feel and where they're at. Um, at that point, you know, uh, like I said, two weeks prior to that, we already had two peak weeks for me. Uh, my guys will do two peak weeks and two weeks of taper. And usually they're they're tapped, and then you're recovering the first half of the first taper part of the taper week, um, and get them come down, and then all of a sudden they're they're ramping up a little bit. But we're we're at that point we're only designated like uh, like a Tuesday like a Monday Thursday type deal, or a Wednesday Saturday um, type expression of where they're at um, on a hard workouts. Everything else is going to be low 50 to 60 percent threshold in a sense. And then that way, these guys are able to recover. I want full recovery the last two weeks. So they can really just blow it out and then recover. And then that way, the cortisol will come up, and then we drop it back down within a couple of days, come up. And then the same thing, um, you know, the last week of recovery, usually on Mondays, are sprints in the morning. And then some pad work uh, for speed. And then also just, uh, you know, blowing it out. And then, you know, the week of the fight's different as far as the next number of days when they have to travel. A lot of times it comes into uh, water retainment in a sense and they're water loading at that time. But, you know, when they're traveling and stuff, uh, it's it kind of adds another component. But at that point, um, you know, the whole camp that what I do differently with the taper weeks is that these guys are losing weight faster and faster because I get them to be uh, to burn more fat during the camp. That's where all the low base training, the cardio outside of it allowed that when we start tapering down, they're doing less volume, less intensity. Their body's actually just just running through there. It's like a furnace. And then we take out the carbs about seven days out um, and mainly just through water-based vegetables that they're getting. So, so you, can drop the, you can drop the volume and then drop the carbs, and then they're just burning more fat. Correct. And a lot of times you're saying, well, that's just kind of – because before they just grind, 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 these all long workouts. But, um, you know, if I get their body working for them and it's working with them, it's a lot easier um, than anything else because most of the time they're, they're weight cut in their program of their cardio or not even just their overall program is separate. They just meet up at, at the end. And that's something that's our issue. That's why we're seeing mm. these guys miss weight. Um, you know, when they can't take diuretics anymore, they're getting tested. 
um, you, you see these people in a completely different stage. And then plus the, the residual effect over time of these hot baths um, that we haven't even really studied in a sense what it does to organs, mm. cerebral spinal fluid. Mm. And that's why you see guys cut a vast amount of weight. They look great on the scale, but all of a sudden they get clipped by just like barely get hit and they're knocked out. Um, and that's something that I think these hot baths at a certain point, they, they're losing a massive amount of weight. They're heating them up. They start at like 105 degrees or 110 degrees or 115 degrees or whatever it is. Some guys are using thermometers and seeing where, how long they're going to be in there. But a lot of times, you know, it's uh, the residual effect two, three fights down the road that their bodies are just not going to cut the weight. Yeah, it works it. this time, but as yeah. time goes on, it's it's not a long-term Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. So today uh, – you got a fighter coming in about 45 minutes. Yep. Uh, Jake, one of you know, guy we're both friends with. Uh, yeah. He's about 10 days or so out. So Correct. What are you going to have him do today? What's it going to look like without giving his you know, important no, I information? Mean, you know what? There, there's no secrets. You know, yeah. th we're not the first person to uh, invent the wheel here. Um, a lot of it is just you know he's doing all of his um, strength and conditioning with uh, Sam Calavita mm -hmm. at uh, the train late, uh, training lab. Mm -hmm. um, he looks, works with Nick Hurston as well. Um, a lot of the stuff is just tapering now of short intervals and uh, getting full recovery short intervals, and now it's just peaking for the fight. Um, with him, with Jake especially, he's such a, a explosive guy. It's mainly just keeping, you know, uh, everything at a minimal, get him to fully recover, and because uh, he's really crushed it the last three weeks of, mm. you know, they, they do a lot of different training, a threshold training over with uh, Sam Calavita. Yeah, there's a lot of that cardio stuff you're talking about. Yeah. A lot of stuff he hasn't done in a long time. So yeah. he's going to get all the way through on Monday, the week of. Mm -hmm. uh, is it one workout a day? Is it a bunch of them? In your ideal, it doesn't matter if it's Jake in particular, a, but what's an yeah. ideal last four or five days before I compete? You know what? The four, the the Monday usually is a run uh, in the morning, a lot of fasted running. Uh, if it's a sprint on the morning of, and then at night it's about an hour. So you're looking at close to about two hours that day. Half of it's going to be low intensity at 50%. Uh, Tuesday is going to be like a short run, uh, 30, 40 minutes, and then they'll do a sauna workout when they get there, like three 10-minute goes with about five minutes in between. Cold shower in between just to kind of – they'll still sweat. It's not really hard. Mm. Uh, Wednesday is going to be a short run in the morning. Again, 40 fasted. Um, and then at, at night, uh, mainly it will be like a 15, 20-minute uh, pad session. And then they'll do, uh, like, again, a little bit of a sauna, not too bad, just super easy. They're still drinking because they're, they're mm. still about about a gallon and a half that day, or about a Wednesday, about a gallon. Um, and then uh, on Thursday, it's going to be, uh, depending on the where you're at, most of my guys will run in the morning again because their legs are sustained for it through the camp. Mm. And then, uh, then they'll do a sauna that night, and usually they're within, I try to get the guys down to about three pounds the night of. Anything less than that, I have them rehydrate and drink again back up again so they're not retained uh, because of the fact they're holding that because now with the new weigh-ins mm -hmm. the weigh-ins are like 9 a.m. so mm -hmm. these guys are getting up at 6 a.m. and a lot of times if they go east coast that's like 3 yeah. a.m. so there's yeah. a lot of time change there and so what I try to do is with that in hand um, I try to get them down about three the night before they'll float especially our guys float about a pound and a half of fat off uh, with the cardio program. I mean, these guys, like, for instance, this last week I worked with Miles Jury for the first time this last seven weeks. He uh, he went from 172 to 145, and he didn't use plastics. He didn't use a hot bath. Um, he was dialed in. He felt great. He, wow. he delivered this last week and just dominated, and he had been off for about a year and a half. And um, there's something to be said about just getting your body to work for you. I mean, that's yeah. basically – if you can get fresh – Big thing is about being fresh in this business, and if these guys going in at 50%, they can't take the performance enhancing drugs like we did before. Where I would say that 90%, you know, if you're not, you're not tested for it, then you know, I guess you should be taking it, you know, at that time. But yeah, people are wondering why there's such a weight problem there, why people are missing it. Mm -hmm. That's because a lot of people were getting away with things before without a real understanding of what they're doing, mm -hmm. and then using those now illegal substances. Yeah, and so you're like, wow, is all this this random? Pro no, it's because they now made. You had to filter out. Do you really understand this process or not? Yeah. And the ones sure. that didn't are falling off fast. Yeah. You see guys that used to be incredible and look in the body. Yeah. I mean, the body will, will speak for you. I mean, yeah. If you look at these guys and you see drastic issues, you're like, like, is it because he stopped lifting or, you know, why yeah. is it that the guy's completely different? Saggy yeah. skin. Yeah. And, all, and it messes with your psyche too. I mean, yeah.
I mean, yeah. you, I mean, it doesn't even matter if it's certain things that you guys drink before pre-workout. Like, oh, maybe I'm not going to have it. I mean, it's a lot of it's placebo effect in some yeah. sense, but mm -hmm. there is something to be said if you can take something that's going to make you stronger, faster, and recover. I mean, you, you don't have to be the same athletes as someone else mm -hmm. at all. I mean, you guys even for a while, a long time ago in CrossFit, you'd be like, how these guys grind like this? And obviously some supplements help, but obviously they're not all taking certain things, but... It's like saying, you know, Mr. Olympia is, is totally clean. Yeah. <laughs> yeah I mean, how do you do that? <laughs> <laughs> I know. Uh, you just mentioned the psychological piece, you know. Yeah. I mean, fighting, of, of all things, is, is an enormous mental game, yeah. uh, like many sports are. Mm -hmm. um, you know, how do you manage the psychology of, of, a, of a fighter in, in the weeks leading up to a fight and then the day of, you know, right before they go into the cage and then, you know, also win or lose? You know, there's going to be, there's gonna be you know, head games. How do you get ready for, you know, the next fight and, and – especially if you lose, how to get ready for the next fight and have that not derail you. Yeah, you know what? Uh, this sport, um, any one-on-one -on -one sport is so psychological. Um, I don't think there's like a, uh, there's a key to everybody. Everybody's got a different way they set themselves up to cycle, like basically get away from the stress, get away from that. Uh, you know, I'm walking in front of 17,000 people and then people worldwide, you know, that now that Fox Sports the last number of years and they made this mm. thing monster, Mm -hmm. um, there's so much more press because they, they got media stuff. They have Instagram, Twitter, Snapchat, whatever. And they they are just a microscope. You know, people look at everything they do. And I think the, the big thing is, you know, uh, I found with a, with a structure, I guess it's kind of like moving, you know, when you guys move and you just kind of wing it. and Like, oh, we're going to move a five-bedroom house or a three-bedroom house or even a one-bedroom apartment. Like, how do we do it? Well, I'll just get it done. Let's yeah, do it. Yeah. And then you're, you're like, completely stressed. You, you don't know where to start, yeah. right? Versus, like, what we talked about uh, with Andy there, he was talking about a plan. Yeah. Uh, you know, once we set out the plan, of course, you have so much more security when you're setting this moving. You're moving a house. And you're like, hey, you know what? The, the movers are here. They're going to be here at 9 o'clock. The boxes are here. They're going to pack this. Do th this is all check, 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 check. So when we do these programs, a lot of times – what I've found is that they find so much value and confidence in just knowing that, hey, dude, we did 13 hours this week. Hey, uh, you know, you're here to this, and they see these. They're, they're just checking off these these weeks. And then when you, you start, hey, I, I always – I'm really big from the Olympic arena um, is the daily things. Um, hey, dude, we've got 93 days out. You know, I'm starting to work with TJ Dillashaw mm -hmm. now. Mm -hmm. And he had, like, at one point I, I text him after the Ultimate Fighter. We, we uh, filmed it, and I was out there from – three, four times, and I was like, hey, dude, we got 109 days left. And he's like, what? Like, yeah. 109 days, man. July 8th, you're fighting. He's like, oh, I, I'm like, yeah, well, we got to make every day count by the minutes. Mm. And he's just taking that approach and, and, and taking that that macro to a micro approach and just seeing where you're at, and we're making everything count. And then all of a sudden they start, you know, they're putting hay in the barn, and they realize that, man, I got it. Like, I've done everything I possibly can. I feel great. Yeah. And that's where that confidence drive. A lot of times, you know, you guys know from going to college or taking any tests, like, you know, if you're going in there and you just read, you just crammed the night before, you're like, oh, I hope I get it. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I mean, seriously. We all know My that students one really never well. do that. Yeah. <laughs> never. They're and all fully prepared. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And that's how it goes with these camps, man. These guys, like, as long as they can get, they have the value and they're like, I did the runs, I did this. Like, they see it. And all of a sudden, when you put the footprint out there and say, hey, this is what we started with. Here's your expectations. Here's what we end up with. Here you are. And then all of a sudden they see the gains. Then they're just like having fun out there. Do you uh, do you encourage them to get really psyched up before they walk out? Do you want them to be calm? How do you approach that? Should they be like, Brah! like right before the fight or dead? What's your approach? You know, my approach is going to be different from everybody. Every fighter I work with is different. It's the same thing as clothing style. You know, I can <laughs> Everyone's got a different approach. I mean, some guys like grungy clothes. Some people like super nice clothes. Some people don't like clothes at all. You know, like Mike. <laughs> <laughs> really, yeah, exactly. Right. Exactly. So <laughs> what they I make, they make me put them on. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we have to be semi presentable, I guess, if you're on film. I guess, yeah. but uh, <laughs> YouTube doesn't like the naked. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Exactly. We could be in that. You know, there's a dating show and there's other different like life in the Amazon or survival thing that you have to be naked with a partner. Or oh, something. the naked one. Yeah. Naked and afraid. Na that there is great. Go. Naked yeah. afraid. That's crazy show right there. <laughs> But uh, you gotta sign up, I'm Mike. not watching TV. <laughs> I, I, I didn't even know this was a thing. I yeah. gotta, I gotta <laughs> sign up. Yeah. So that is a, a huge thing with a psychological piece because these guys are all different. But the only thing you can do is kind of like embrace what they're doing, 
But the main thing is just get them uh, to uh, just think about just, I try to, uh, you know, I, I had a, that kind of makes me remember I was sitting at Chael Sonnen's house. He's getting ready to fight Anderson Silva the second time. Mm-hmm. And we've been friends forever. And he's like, hey, you know what? Uh, how do you do it? I'm like, what do you mean? He's like, because he, he had a history for a long time beating these guys up and they get arm barred or triangled every time. Mm. Like he doesn't get knocked out. Like the first Anderson fight. Yeah. I mean, all the time. He'll he'll go through three rounds of beating someone up or two rounds of beating someone up, and then all of a sudden he gets triangled. And you're like, where did yeah. that come from? Here, a great grappler. You know what's going on. You know this is coming. Mm. And, you know, I sat there with him, and he's like, I, I don't know how you do it. I, th- I said, do what? He's like, you just compete without fear. And I'm like, what do you mean? And I'm like, I said, uh, you know what, Chael, that's a good question. I, I was thinking about it. He's like, you know, I, I always think the guy's going to do it. Here he is. He's going to do it. He's strong. Here he's going to do it. He's, he's going to get me. He's going to get me. And I'm like, well, I, I just try to focus. You know, my Olympic coaches are like, hey, man, just worry about what you can control and try to not to stress about things. I mean, there's a guy, Ken Revisa, that was at yeah, Cal State yeah. Fullerton. Yeah. That was my first ever psychology coach. Mm. And he's like, hey, you're one pitch at a time. You know, he's like, when the shit hits the fan, what are you going to do? You know, like the basketball player that just gets it knocked away from there or stolen, you're going to sit there and sulk or you're going to run back and defend. Mm-hmm. And that's something that um, that's stuck with me uh, for a long time, the way of a piece of worry. One of his friends, you know, he wrote that book. And, uh, and then going back with my Olympic coaches, like, hey, you know what? Things are going to go against you, but I need you to focus on what you can control, position. And so my answer to Chael and uh, my other fighters are, hey, look, we're going to go position by position, breath by breath. Mm. And all of a sudden, they start thinking, they, they, they it's like going up the stairs, like, okay, i got to go to the top of the Empire State Building. How am I going to get there? Like, oh, i got all these stairs. Like, no, I just one foot in front of the other. And that's the same thing with the psychological piece. Yeah. I don't know how they psych themselves up, if it's a, they have a particular song, they have to go super hard. But the main thing is, it's like, hey, be you today. Just be you. That's it. All I need you to do is step up and be you. You don't have to be extraordinary. Be you and relax and, and focus on what you can control. And, you know, most of the time it's punch by punch. Yeah. One of the things that Ken would talk about is if you're not the rah-rah guy, don't be the rah-rah guy. Correct. If you if you are the, the rah-rah guy, be the guy. Don't yeah. be afraid. Don't, yep. you know, go in that direction. Yep. And the other big lesson was if you, prior to the situation, acknowledge the worst-case scenario. Yeah. And then you can think through it. It's all of a sudden not nearly as scary when it happens. So yep. if you think about, okay, well, worst past possible case scenario, yeah. uh, this happened to me my first national weightlifting meet, is I missed my first snatch. And then I had to follow myself and then follow myself again. Wow. And I wasn't mentally prepared for it, and so I bombed all three. Yeah. The next time I was completely prepared for it because the whole training camp for that next meet was, what's going to happen if I miss my first snatch? Yep. Okay, I'm ready now to snatch the heaviest weight I can possibly snatch after a two-minute rest. I remember mm-hmm. you were training to follow yourself after that, and before that, exactly. you were taking minutes between. I would take ten yeah. minutes between each repetition, and yeah. now it was, okay, I am physically ready. So when I walked into the platform, I didn't miss it, but I, I was totally confident, oh, if I miss this here, I'm ready. I know I'll be ready to go again in two minutes. So mm-hmm. in Shale's case, the same thing. Like, mm-hmm. okay, this guy's going to go for a triangle. I know he's going to go for a triangle. What's the worst-case scenario? He gets me close. Mm-hmm. I'm still a good enough grappler. I know how to defend a triangle or get out of it. Correct. That's what we need to approach yourself. So worst case scenario, I fall or I lose my grip here or I'm. what's going to happen? Acknowledge it and have a plan of attack. And then if it does happen, you're in a much better position. Yeah, no, I think that's important. Uh, just uh, putting yourself there. And, you know, like I said, it doesn't matter what happens. It's how you're going to respond to it. I mean, that's another thing. And I, I think that, you know, with my guys, it's always like weekly affirmation, affirmations, daily affirmation, you're doing the right thing, how you feel. Uh-huh. You know, these things are normal. It's, uh, you know, if it's a good good day or a bad day, tomorrow we still have to put our, you know, boots on and, and hat on and go to work. Mm-hmm. It does, I mean, I don't care if you want a title or you don't want a title. You remember, that was good as it was yesterday. Anything, if you, if you make all this money, the, tomorrow's still another day. And that's something that I, you know, I took, you know, from my coaches at Olympic Training Center, Steve Frazier, Olympic champ for the U.S., um, first ever Greco champ, and, is you got to just keep grinding and, and, and do it on a daily basis. Um, you know, this blue-collar uh, work attitude is something that I, I take, you know, because a lot of times, you know, we're, we're given talent. Some of us are not. I mean, I'm not a person that I ever really had much growing up. But a lot of times it was just putting the work in because at the end of the day, talent is only goes so far. And I guarantee you majority of all athletics, especially combat sports, any other thing, the guys that work hard, uh, are usually probably, I would say, 90% of the time better than the talented people in high school mm-hmm. or growing up. 
but the people that are extraordinary that are, are the people that had that athletic talent but also were humble enough to work their ass off and then all of a sudden they just explode and that's why we see particularly like the Michael Jordans the bronze of the world Kobe Bryant's I mean you see certain talented, and you guys all know them and seen them before, certain talented weightlifters, certain talented athletes. You're like, man, they're so talented. It's just a waste. Hmm. Yeah. And, hmm. you know, that's something that, uh, you know, I try to instill these guys. Hey, look, it doesn't matter what you are. you got to work every day. You're not entitled to anything. You know, life's a gift, you know. Hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And you're, you're not competing anymore, but you, you still work pretty damn hard. Like, you're, you're one of the few coaches that actually trains right there alongside with his athletes. Do you, yeah, do you feel like that that helps with having like a, a special connection or a bond with your athletes as they are prepping for their fights? Yeah, you know what? I, I just uh, this last January I turned 41, and uh, I've been I, I I work out with these guys, and uh, I try to keep up with them, and I do their sprints. Um, I, I try to be in with them. I thought a lot of it that's trust, you know, and hmm. I can do it as long as I can. But you know, I think that uh, there's something there. There really is something about someone being next to you, you know, picking up that shovel and digging with you, you know, someone yeah. to, to help you up, mm -hmm. you know, someone for them to help you up type thing. And so that brotherhood creates a bond and also a sense of confidence. Like, Hey man, this guy's doing it with me. Like he's not just telling me, Hey, I, I'm, I'm, I'm a nutritionist and I'm 300 pounds telling mm -hmm. you, Hey, you guys skinny, you know, like I've never done it myself, but I've seen it on YouTube. Yeah. So there is something <laughs> with that for sure. I love your Instagram account because you'll post a lot of the videos and stuff you're doing, and it's always you soaking wet, doing some really <laughs> awesome drill. And it's not like, hey, here's a video I'm yeah. filming. Now watch my athlete go do it. It's yeah. you dripping of sweat or red marks all over your face yeah. or whatever and dumping somebody or flipping somebody around. Yeah. And it's always really interesting stuff. But one of the things that, that I noticed really quickly on your Instagram stuff is you focus a lot on, in MMA, it's, it's called the transition game. Uh -huh. Right? Yep. So we, Doug and I were, t were talking earlier. Mm. You can't wrestle in MMA the same way you wrestle in the Olympic trials. Correct. And you can't weightlift in CrossFit the same way you weightlift in weightlifting. Correct. So how do you put that together mentally uh, of saying, okay, I actually have to modify this for the different sport now, or, and how do you communicate that with your athlete mm -hmm. between saying, yeah, I know we used to do it this way for this thing, but we actually have to do it differently here. So that's something. Um, you know, it's also just trying to put together, you know, like when you guys write and do a bunch of stuff, like how do you put – enough information so it flows all together so you get the same uh, hypothesis or your overall value content of it so it's got to be seamless in a transition right mm. so what i do with the guys and i'm starting to you know i'm creating something that transitions are where you're going to score your biggest opportunities and a lot of the times if you don't have something or know how to sequence it together make a seamless transition um uh you know basically i'm trying to save time energy and money in a way where if I can do one efficient process, then all of a sudden they're getting the most bang for their buck in that position as far as energy expenditure, mm. as well as opportunity to get take or to take someone down or to finish a strike or a kick. So the big thing I have to do that I started doing is not just be a wrestling coach. Um, a lot of wrestling is bent over. You're like you're you're reaching for something. Um, and in a fight game, if you do that, a lot of guys are going to, you know, kick you in the face, yeah. in the face <laughs> you know, so not good. a lot of the times, 90% of the fights on your feet standing straight up. Um, and what I tried to do is transition. I, I went to watch all these top coaches when I was coaching their athletes and just, I'd go in the practice where I didn't need to be there. I didn't need to be the Sparting. I didn't need to be there, but I needed to watch their footwork. Mm -hmm. I needed to be where the positions are at. So they have more of a neutral spine where they're at. How do we defend from here and not sprawling? Because there's a lot of like just gravity in general of, of defending takedowns. You see all the time strikers getting taken down, but a lot of it's footwork. They try to sprawl. They're underneath their, their core is not engaged. Their footwork's not engaged. And, and as you know, your trunk, like from Olympic lifting, like everything happens from your hips. So you have the bars and extension of your hips in a way. So you're keeping as close as possible, pulling up tight. You don't want to be more than, you know, if you're every inch or half an inch, that adds another 5, 10, 15 pounds, whatever it may be. So what I try to do is like I, I try to take everything from what they're comfortable with. You know, I'm not changing anything. So mm -hmm. I'm, if they're comfortable in their orthodox or southpaw stance, then I'm adjusting that. So all my positions and footwork is from there. Offensive wrestling and defense. So it's striking. So, you know, like a guy like uh, TJ Dillashaw that throws a ton of strikes and he's moving all the time. I mean, you know, he's a Cal State 14 yeah. guy too. And so these guys are moving all the time. And so how does he get to his strike? Because he, he had been uh, a major 
guy that does a ton of strikes and kicks. He's moving. But his takedown game was off. Like, he would shoot straight on and get stuffed. So I'm like, dude, if you, if once we start doing this, I started looking at footwork and how he switches his steps and how he does kicks. And then I started incorporating that into takedowns. So he fought John Lineker just recently. Phenomenal. And he took him down four times. He's on top of the guy that hits harder than anybody in that division. Heavy, heavy handed. Like, he's Anthony Johnson, that division. Mm-hmm. And I basically said, dude, I need you to rock. I need you to step over one step and get to this hip and drop him from the back, not go in front and try to you know, where the muscle is. He took him down four times, five times. He was on top seven minutes of it. Broke the guy's jaw, who's never been hit like that. And a lot of it was just from his footwork because adjusting a switch step. And it wasn't necessarily because if he can hit him with a punch or he can hit him with a kick, he can do a takedown and vice versa. So all of a sudden there becomes a seamless transition of it's unpredictable. Mm -hmm. And as you've seen in certain fights, the guys get predictable because, oh, he's only has a right hand or stay off this side or defend the takedown. He can't do anything. So what I try to do is take what they do great, that foundation. I'm not breaking it up. And I'm keeping it there, and I'm going to add one or two sequences from there to say, here, here's a defense. Here's the trigger points. Because I basically funnel everything down to one or two things. Then that's it's in, it's like a true false test. Yeah. Before they do these multiple choice tests, they're like, oh, am I going to do this? Am I going to do that? And all of a sudden, they get taken down, they get knocked out. And so I try to funnel everything down to them. So I'm like, hey, you know what? From this position, just go to here to here. That's it. All of a sudden, they're like, really? That's it? I'm like, yeah, because I'm going to neutralize. I'm going to give him one opportunity. It's like, you know, a cattle coming down the chute. There's not four or five different ways, and I'm trying to block this cattle off. I'm just basically, here's the chute, and I'm just going to open it, and this is the only opportunity they have. This is where this cow is coming through. So that's the thing. It's, it's, I think what we, the biggest thing in MMA and, and, and is the thing is, is a lot of the striking coaches don't go to wrestling practices. Striking coaches don't go to jiu-jitsu or vice versa. And so what I was trying to say, hey, you know what? If I'm going to learn the whole game, I'm not a, ha- I'm not a striking coach by, by no means. These guys are amazing what they do. What I I'm, I'm need to blend into the system and be my spoke in the wheel. But if I can do that and it makes everything else better, then all of a sudden these guys are now more confident on their feet. They're throwing at will because they can defend and they know if I'm getting taken down, I need to have my position here. And I only work on a couple things. So all of a sudden... Because in camp, you can only work on so much. Yeah. Um, everyone talks about, I'm going to get stronger, faster, fitter, yeah. uh, more technical. But the problem is, is that majority of the time, these guys are not year-round training on a daily basis. They'll take three months off, and they'll train for seven weeks. And then now they have to lose 25 pounds. Yeah. They're taking in 1,000 calories at a time. And then they're overtrained. They're doing all these rounds thinking they could do this. And then they show up. It's a byproduct of a system that most of the time there's no plan they all do it and they're amazing fighters and amazing athletes and coaches are amazing but the problem is is that you're cramming for graduating from college every three four weeks five weeks and taking three months off and then all of a sudden you're like why am i getting the same score like because i'm not improving you right know? Mm-hmm. yeah i was i was at a, a wrestling clinic that brandon slay was putting on like maybe 10 years ago yep you know brandon slay yeah he's an amazing guy yeah, he's an Olympic gold medalist in wrestling. Yeah, yeah uh, went to Penn. And yeah, I, I spent a lot of time with the Olympic Training Center with him. Okay, oh, yeah. Yeah. he's Very a great cool. guy. Yeah. Yeah. Well, one thing that he, that he said that I that I have remembered, you know, to this day, and that I've uh, tried to apply over the years is that uh, when he's when he's coaching somebody, he recommends they spend about seventy five percent of their time on their strengths, the things they're really really good at, because those are the things that are actually going to win the mm-hmm. competition or win the match yeah. or win the fight. Uh, and about tw- 20% on things they're kind of good at, and then only really 5% of their time on things that they're just never, ever, ever going to be good at. Right. Um, you know, <laughs> taking someone who's just never going to be, uh, you know, in MMA, they're never going to be a world-class wrestler. If you spend all your time wrestling, all, you're just going to turn into a mediocre wrestler, and yep. then... You're still going to get taken down. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So yeah <laughs> the good wrestlers are still going to dominate. You might as well right. get really, really, really good at, you know, if you're kickboxer or whatever, at, at your striking, because that's how you're going to win your fights, you know? Mm-hmm. Um, do, you, do you do you agree with those points, not agree with them? What, what are your thoughts on how much time to allocate towards your strengths versus your weaknesses? Yeah, you know what? Um, Brandon, you know, his lineage, I mean, the guy went to University of Pennsylvania. I mean, important school of business out there. Yeah. So if you think about it, like, uh, he's, he's a smart guy. Um, a lot of times, if you look at that, that's just like a typical a top salesman type deal. You take 80% of the, your, your core value, for your, your core uh, money that's coming in, you spend majority of that t- time there. Mm-hmm. Another 15% or so on just on new stuff you want to try to incorporate to cultivate, cultivate and 5% on stuff that you maybe you'll never get that are just that are out of this atmosphere. So when it comes into MMA or even anything else, 
um, I think that's important. I think that you still got to keep who you are. Um, I don't care if uh, the media or anybody's trying to change. You need to be a knockout person. You need to be a submission person. You need to be a wrestler. Mm. If you go in there being a karate person or Krav Maga or whatever your background is, you keep that. I mean, it's uh, you can't change your identity. The more you change your identity, then you're going to have a point that uh, you forget who you are at a certain point. Um, and then you start lacking confidence in everything you do. Mm. I think that's the, the most important thing to stick to who you are. I think you make tweaks. I, I don't think you change anything up. But, I mean, if you're winning doing one thing, yeah, it's it's not as extravagant as someone else getting knockouts. But you're winning. Um, we all have different ways to win. We all have different ways that we survive and, and we're successful. I think that is, like, we're spot on. I mean, uh, I think that the biggest thing we try to do is try to change up and be other people. And the more that we're ourselves, the more that we're confident in that. And we know what we can do and what we can't do. And the extra stuff is adding an em elements to enhance who we are, not to change. Mm -hmm. I've never gone through an eight-week camp getting ready for a UFC fight myself, personally. Right. right. Turns out, never fought in the UFC. <laughs> I haven't been yeah. UFC yet. <laughs> hey, you'd be still surprised. Time. Still time. Yeah. And he's still got some knockouts out there, I imagine. Yeah. <laughs> it's um, not too late, though. Right. And I've never competed at the CrossFit Games, but my, I would imagine going through that eight-week camp, at some point, you're going to not want to do it anymore. Yeah. So how do you keep it fun? Anything you do to make the athletes like, oh, this is fun again today, when you get to that lull point of like, oh, I really don't want to work out today. Yeah, I mean, it's getting punched in the face is uh, not an easy thing on a weekly basis. Right? So, <laughs> you know, a lot of the time it's um, it's trying to uh, – it, that's where the whole periodization thing goes into. Yeah. you got to make it enough where they're in the, they're in the uh, red uh, threshold, but they just don't want to um, – you don't want to overcook them. And it's yeah. just the same thing like – you know, like cooking meat and stuff. I know you guys deal uh, with different people within the nutrition industry. And the guy out in, uh, where is he, in Alabama now? Who's that? The other, uh, is it Milfit? Uh, oh, yeah. Oh, oh Thomas. Thomas. Thomas, Cox Thomas Cox in Cox. Tennessee. Yeah, so Thomas, yeah, great, dude. He's a, he's a great guy, but also comes into how, how do you get the, all his meat to be tender and over time. So yeah. how does too much, too much heat, too much this to make it happen? So what we try to do is, when you overcook these guys um, when it's too much training, then that's where it becomes unfun. Yeah. That's where it becomes like, hey, man, I don't want to get up and do this. But if you get it in the right like, right balance, and that's where the whole program comes in. Like, they're fresh enough, but they're not. You yeah. know? And, yeah. and then all of a sudden, they, they start enjoying it more. They get more they get more enjoyment out of it because they're, they're enjoying the process. Um, I always really stress the fact that it, this is bound to happen. But the big thing is is that you're going to snap back. And then all of a sudden, because as you guys know, like with anything else, when you're tired and depleted, you, you don't want to do it and you hate it. The yeah. process sucks. Versus like, you know, you're putting it there, you're recovering, getting it, and all, then you're starting to see gains. And that's the thing. It slowly gains every three weeks, and then we have a recovery week is what I kind of do. Mm -hmm. um, and so they're four-week blocks. So all of a sudden, they're like, they're really, yeah, man, I'm, I'm starting to feel it. I'm like, hey, in the next couple of days, you're going to start to feel this. This is where the end of stage this is the end of building. And then all of a sudden, they're like, man, I'm starting to feel it. Man, I feel amazing. Yeah. So all of a sudden, mm -hmm. you have these highs and lows again. And that's where the periodization, I think, is the biggest aspect of keeping guy fresh, keeping him motivated because he's starting to see incremental gains and over time he's getting leaner he's getting faster and all of a sudden he's just like man i love this i yeah. can really think and enjoy this book you know right. I'm, I'm reading it i'm not just reading a front to co a book front to back and i don't remember what happened in it mm -hmm. right yeah, I'd imagine it helps knowing that this is supposed to be a high volume week. I'm supposed to be tired. I'm supposed to be be beaten down. It's yeah. supposed to be a little bit beyond what I would want to do every single week. Right. And then because it's a high volume week, knowing that the next week is going to be a recovery week, they can, they can push through a little bit harder on that high volume week, knowing that they're going to be able to back off soon. Correct. Yeah. And that, like I said, this is the same thing with the plan. I mean, if yeah. we're driving out to North Dakota – and I have a, we have a plan that in place through MapQuest. We know we're, hey, we're only like 50 miles away. And before we're just, we're like, okay, great, we're almost there. Problem is, is we have no MapQuest and we're just, you know, winging it. I don't know how far that is. Is it three days from now or is it two hours from now? So I think that's the cool thing is that when you give them the footprint and you give them where we're at and where we're going to finish, then they can see the timeline that, hey, man, we have uh, 12 days left. I mean, I, 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 on a daily basis, most of the time, I send them a picture of themselves as well as a daily down countdown of its, you know, uh, five days, 13 hours, 45 minutes, X amount of seconds. So it becomes reality, and it brings them back to present. Yeah. I think the more that we're present with our training, the more we're present with people, all of a sudden we're, we're in the moment. And we're not worrying about things we can't control two days from now. We're not stressed, and that extra stuff, our mind doesn't wander. You know, it's so basically if I can see my hand, that's what I need. And I, like, I like that method, a picture. Yeah. Send a picture of them. That's 
Yeah, because they're gonna like wake you up. And go, oh fuck. Yeah, man. That's I, for me. I, I send a, a picture of themselves in a fighting thing or whatever. Mm-hmm. Like, you know, I, of Jeremy Stevens of like he's 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 in it and just his game face. He's in like, and then I'll I'll be like down as like countdown. It's like UFC Kansas City, four days or five days X Y and Z, and all of a sudden they it brings them back to saying, okay, I got today. First, right. they're like, oh, I'll get there. What's going on? And now, yeah, yeah. you know, they're they're today. They're ready. You know. Yeah. yeah. Anyways, this is like a daily thing I try to do because, you know, I drive in the Olympic Training Center in Colorado Springs, and they would have, like, days to ex-Olympics. And it makes – even if it's, like, 900, you're like, wow, like, <laughs> it's there. Yeah, you know? yeah, it's yeah, yeah. It's up. not just out there. But, yeah, yeah it's – Right. It, I like that countdown. Yeah, yeah, that's the thing, and it comes to everything else because it gives you a presence of mind. It gives you to refocus again because, as you know, like, you know, if, we, if you don't have any goals and you don't have anything in your face to stimulate, you don't – you don't really know where you're going. You don't even know why you're doing it sometimes. And then you get bored, and then you're like, no, I'll just get there when I, I'll crunch time. You're like, no, man, today's a gift. It's going to be gone. The clock's ticking regardless of whatever you do in your life. Yeah. You yeah. know? Daryl, I think we'll end there. Thanks, man. Thanks for coming on the show. Yeah, really thanks for having it. me. You yeah, bet. I appreciate it. Uh, wow. Is there anything? <laughs> I, th- I thought you were going to end right oh, there. Yeah, there I, I, I was going to jump in and be like, where can people see you? Yeah, where, yeah. Like, yeah, where what, can What's your social it? media? You got websites, anything like you that? You know, I, webs- I just um, uh, Instagram is, is Daryl C-H, D-A-R-R-Y-L-C-H. Um, and uh, I'm at Studio 540 in Solana Beach. I, I, I'm there with uh, Joel Tudor uh, and, again, Rob Zepps that started that thing. Um, I'm also at Physical Culture. You guys know. I've seen you guys there. Mm-hmm. A great group of guys with Tommy and uh, and all the crew there. Um, and then I come up to Ruka here. Uh, today at 10 o'clock, you'll see some different guys. I'm working with Tiffany Van Seuss behind me. Uh, she's a glory world champ right now. She's one of the best strikers on the planet. So fun to watch her kickbox. Oh, yeah. She's, she's a beast. Yeah. 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 This cute little mouse-looking girl, and she just blows things yeah. to pieces. <laughs> yeah, so we'll have yeah. Kylan in here a little later today. Usually I work with Bismarck sometimes here. Mm-hmm. Um, like I said, I, you know, it's funny. This whole place, uh, this whole side of this place was not here. Um, Austin Armour, like, helped help push this thing out. Uh, he does all the advocate stuff. You got Bryce over there doing some a lot of pad work. He works with, um, you know, Cyborg. He works, mm-hmm. He's been out in Thailand a long time, a long career, Muay Thai. But, you know, in 2004, um, I had BJ Penn come out to Olympic Training Center. And uh, first time I ever met the guy, and he was fighting Matt Hughes mm-hmm. like a month later. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, he came out, and we just beat, we beat him up. I mean, we're wrestling. He's not used to it, but also the altitude. He's come from Hilo, and we're out there just killers. I mean, our room was – he was, like, behind poles. He's like, man, I'm exhausted. <laughs> I'm like, get over here, man. Like, yeah. He's super quiet, super respectful. love the guy. And, mm-hmm. man, I, I worked with him. And then he you know, he submitted Matt Hughes. And, you know, my Olympic coach was, like, told him, Momir Petrovic, who's, like, he's a no – no bullshit guy. I mean, you're late a minute, you're gone. You're like, hey, leave it. You might be number one in the country, you know, one in the world. He's like, hey, I'm sorry, I'm out here. And it's funny, he's, uh, after he won, you know, he's like, hey, I just want to thank Momir Petrovic. And Momir's like, what? And I don't know anybody. And all of a sudden, he's like, you, you know, he just told me, he's like, you got to be one crazy son of a bitch to do this fighting stuff, <laughs> you know. And I think, you know, going from that and what Pat Tenori's done here at Ruka, you know, I, I'm so blessed and, and thankful to be able to come in here. Um, and they developed this stuff, and also McKenzie and stuff, you know, has, you know, put in a good, you know, his whole system in there, and he's doing a lot of art of breath stuff, and that's another guy, Brian McKenzie, you guys have been around him, I have utmost respect for another crazy guy like myself, <laughs> but, uh, yeah, man, this place is awesome, and this is what I spend a lot of my time here, and, um, during the week, uh, I come up here, so. Yeah, uh, that said, thank you to Ruka for, for hosting us today, uh, we, we like doing shows here. Yeah, yeah, no. Yeah. Ruka Sports, great, man. They're doing, they're, they're really doing a human technology thing of development here, but it's awesome. Yeah, yeah. awesome. awesome. Cool. Thanks, Daryl. Yeah, thanks, thanks for having me, guys. You bet.